good. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here and uh, as the first guest, especially. No, well, thank you for blessing our first episode with your unique information and just being here and being a part of the community and allowing uh, to share your information with, with, with the group and everything. So welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll do my best to be here. You know, whatever questions you have, try, try my best to answer. All right. Great. Thanks. Thanks. So this is with the shits. And so we are showcasing marginalized businesses and professionals and entrepreneurs and their experiences. And I really wanted to touch on the significance of you in your entirety, in your industry. And I just wanted to first open it up with what is it that you do and who is Damien? Well, um, <laughs> excuse me. I am uh, 38 years old, father, husband, veteran, uh, black, not necessarily in that order, I guess, in everybody's eyes. Um, and also a building engineer. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess it depends on which which perspective I'm being looked at is uh, which Damien that you encounter, if that makes sense. <laughs> Great. I think that's, um, I mean, fair to say, especially now you don't really know how you're perceived, but you know that you wear a lot of hats and you are a different pe- different person to different people. So, yeah. yeah, that's a pretty good general overview. And and it's just, you know, what is a building engineer? Uh, you know, there's tons of engineers. From what I gather, there's about six different uh, main types of engineers. And then there's also huge, hundreds of categories. So I just... This wasn't sure, you know, what exactly is building engineer, chief building engineer? Okay. Uh, so engineer uh, basically runs the day-to-day operation, building, facility, property. Uh, I myself have been in and out of the property management business and facilities operations business for about 20 years, um, 18. Wow. And I had some great mentors in the business. Uh, one is Tom Holliman. He's an architect in Philadelphia pretty much retired now. Another one is uh, my mentor, Alvin Grant. Uh, he um, had a few businesses. He was an entrepreneur. And the skills that they showed me, along with, you know, things that my father showed me, even even younger, is just like a tinkerer messing around with love. the things that they and, uh, I've learned and picked up along the way have helped me in this career path. I think, um, especially when it comes to being a, a building engineer or really in any sort of technical or mechanical engineer experience does tend to speak more so than formal education if that makes sense so like i said i've been doing this for 20 years um a building engineer chief building engineer they run the day-to-day operations of a building or facility so that's uh anything plumbing mechanical uh uh, hvac uh, anything that you can think of that maintains the operations of the building, keeps the electric on, you know, keeps the water moving, fire life safety systems, all these things that you have to be aware of. And also security from time to time. Uh, security can become a very big factor in the operation of your building because if someone suddenly has keys to your generator room or um, if uh, certain gates or locks or don't work or anything like that, you know, maybe your fire life safety system is compromised maybe your hvac system is compromised maybe even your plumbing so there's a lot of nuances to being a building engineer oh so you are like the back of the house brains of the building after i'm 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 assuming after a certain size not every building not like require demands your type of uh expertise i would say no, I mean, you know, you would think pretty much anybody that has their own home is pretty much like their own building engineer, if you say, but it's just on a smaller scale. But, uh, you know, it, it could not, it doesn't even have to be a building. It could be a boat. Like, there's a lot of things that aren't ships. You know, uh, anything that basically is a self-contained unit. Um, 
that that's more than just a, a single residential domicile or, or living dwelling. So even if you had like a, uh, I know a lot of people that you talk to, um, uh, what do you call them, multi multifamily units, like you know, like a quadplex or a duplex or something like that, may not require a chief engineer, but basically those those same skills go into running that as a individual uh, standalone building as a unit. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So that's good to know. Um, quite a, so the size and just, it just, it's a micro to a macro exactly. sort of flip. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you get like a 15 story high rise, like the one that I run in Portland. Um, yeah. You're going to probably have a chief engineer for something like that. It's mixed use. It's going to be big systems that you use big HVAC systems. Sometimes they use chillers, you know, those big, big boiler systems. Uh, amenities of the building too does that building have a fitness center or, or a hot tub or a pool or something like that you know things that that require uh preventative uh i definitely would say that there's like probably a life count when you think about when you want to have a chief engineer um are, are people's lives on the line if something goes wrong uh in this case of an emergency do you have somebody there that has maintained the systems well enough to, to make sure they do what they're supposed to do to, to save lives. So yeah, that's, there is a definite scale factor when it comes to, um, have, you know, whether or not your organization is going to have or require a chief engineer. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So definitely on what I would assume are like the mixed use commercials and I guess anything that would be a considered a commercial mix and, residential multi-unit so anything over they deem anything over six units well really the anything over four um within the commercial space and then you have mix where there's retail which what it sounds like you are talking about retail and amenities for residents exactly yep. okay all right i mean that's good but but you're saying that so how do you so how do you get involved? Like, how do you, I understand your experience that you just kind of briefly, I'm pretty sure it's more in depth than that, but you just kind of briefly ran over um, what you've done to get, but how do you get into this industry? Is there, I mean, I know that you were saying practical more than in formal schooling. So what exactly, how would someone, how would someone get into this industry? If uh, in hindsight, you know, looking back, <clears throat> if I were to, like, for instance, coach someone into being a chief engineer, I would definitely have them go to some sort of trade school um, and not even something super intensive. You know, if you get like basic plumbing, basic electricity, you can you can definitely make paths and inroads and start to gain the experience that's necessary to become a building engineer. But something that's even easy, like just doing a uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC, if you go and get a certification in that, you know, things like that, um, those would be, that would be the path that I would tell somebody to take is go get a, go to get an HVAC certification, get an EPA certification, get a, um, a telecommunication certification, find some niche that's within a building um, and, and become the master of it. Like if you like electricity and you'll break down a building, what, what's in the building, you know, it's plumbing, there's electrical, there's uh, HVAC, uh, boiler systems, chiller systems, you know, things like that. If you want to learn one of those things, break down one of those those jobs, figure it out, and then you can make your inroads. And then that's when you go into what sort of facility it is that you would like to run. <clears throat> so um, for the most part, when I started out, I was with property management. Uh, Tom Holloman, he had a... Uh, a uh, it's like 40 unit building uh, called the Hillcrest in, on Drexel campus in Philadelphia. And I was lucky enough to get the chance really? to like, yeah, <laughs> get the chance to shout, uh, to, uh, shadow him. And he taught me a lot and, you know, doing unit turns, uh, preventive maintenance for the building, uh, you know, boiler inspections, uh, checking out, making sure there's no, no break their heads or, you know, just so, so hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. You said that you are now, you said in your 30s, in your late 30s, you said 38. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, how old were you when you were doing this then? If that yeah. was 18, 18. Uh, I'd say like I, I started out bare bones doing demo, 
just you know, just cleaning okay. up a work site, you wow. know, ripping out the walls. Started from the bottom. You know, okay. <laughs> ripping out walls, throwing stuff in a big forty yard dumpster all day long, sweating. <laughs> Doing a real demo. Um from there, you know, just meeting people, talking, like I said, I, I met Alvin, I met Tom. They actually had properties and they were like, Hey, if you can demo something, then you know, I'm pretty sure you can screw something out. Or if I can show you how to power wash, then you can do that. Or if I can I remember the first thing he showed me uh Tom wanted to show me how to do is uh, redo concrete steps. So that was <laughs> Oh wow, that's a yeah. I mean that's a trade. That's something that that, somewhere someone's getting paid right now for that someone because someone doesn't know how to do it not because they don't want to because someone doesn't know how to do it so i mean that's a trade all in itself just rebuilding stuff wow okay okay i'm sorry uh continue no 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 fine um yeah that's that was one of the first tasks he gave me uh and then he was like all right well then paint the steps so then paint the curb paint these walls can you go into this apartment and screw in a light bulb okay can you flip a breaker can you, you know, unclog a toilet so then you just start getting more work. You just start doing things. Uh, the more open you are to it, the more you want to do it, then, you know, it, it comes to you because people have problems all the time. And uh, he would start telling me about his friends, start doing some work for some of his friends. Uh, he actually gave me a, I wish I could remember, down in South Philly. She had her home and she wanted to get the 70-year-old paint off. And, you know, so I was in, in her son's room using paint stripper and figuring out how to do that process and like you learn along the way that's like valuable experience that you know you can put it on your resume but usually during the interview you know when you're talking to those people that are evaluating you that's when you can shine and, and, and when you know the lay terms when you know exactly the steps and processes and things people get to assess you like that because that is really sort of how this industry works is your talent set is do you know what you're talking about you know, a lot of people don't really go off of the paperwork so much i mean the paperwork certifies that you, you've been there you've done that that you are right, uh, right that you're recognized in, in the eyes of the state if you will <laughs> but, right but right amongst your amongst your peers they want to know you didn't even know how to turn the water off man you know like, that's, 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 right, that's, right. that's the sort of things that they're 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 looking at you know Okay, but so, okay, so someone that's, so I heard you say to find a niche and to work hard at that. So how would someone say, someone, so say someone's midway through this process and this is an aspiration of theirs just to move on to bigger, a bigger project, not necessarily even this exact title, but to move up in bigger projects. How would they, how would you, think that they should convey their experience when moving up so say like you were talking about different trades and becoming good at those and networking and things like that like if they are say a maintenance tech of sorts and they specialize in just maybe plumbing how would how do you think they would be able to pivot and just completely come into kind of you know just pivot with what they've learned how would you go with one tool and then pivot into more of a widespread of skill set specifically with plumbing you know that's that's sort of like a crossroads tech uh profession if i will if I will, if that makes sense um what i mean by that is with plumbing you you know you have to be pretty much licensed you, you go through like a union process where you go as apprenticeship, journeyman, and the master, you know, so on and so forth, as you complete higher and higher skills of plumbing. And that in and of itself can be a career. You can go and get a job at a plumbing company and just work through their apprenticeship programs and stuff like that and, and really just work your way up and be a plumber your entire life. But if you want to do different challenges every day, what you can do is take your, your plumbing expertise, if you will, Say if you're just an apprentice at plumbing, you pretty much know what is going to happen. Like if there's a problem with plumbing in a building, you can look at it, assess it, and know I got to call a plumber or I can turn this water off and fix this. Or you know, that is basically the idea of the building engineer. If you want to get to the level of running the the, uh, the ship, if you will then you have to think of things like, you know, in, in a big picture sense, you're not going to be turning every 
wrench on every pipe. You know, that's that's specifically what a plumber would do. But like engineering in itself is just problem solving. So I mean, no matter what term you you hear uh, engineer applied to, you might as well just think of it as problem solving. So you hear civil engineering. How do you civilly? How do you problem solve um, civil areas? You know, how do you? building engineer how, how am i problem solving this building you know <laughs> and that's what it is Correct. from day to day is just different problems come up with different systems and they have to be you know attacked in different ways with different priority levels and that really is the juggling act and the nuances of a building engineer as opposed to like someone that is deeply mired in their profession like an electrician like electrician you can go and you can once you become a journeyman electrician you go through certain programs you, you get in the union you can become your own electrician, you know, become licensed, bonded, you go get your own money, you go work your own cases, you know, you, or you can just stay with a company and rise in the company. But if you want to be a building engineer, then you're going to need to know how to do a lot more than just like electrical work. You're going to need to know how to do the electrical work, do the plumbing, know those codes, you know, or at least have an idea of what those codes are going to be that if you do see something like, uh, a plumbing line over an electrical line, you can spot that and be like, oh, that's an instant fire hazard. Like, <laughs> we got to fix that. I need, I need to know. I got to call an electrician. I got to call a plumber in and get these things changed. You know, it really is a, a, a all-encompassing thing when you're talking about building engineering and or even just being a maintenance tech, and that's picking up those skills. So I guess, you know, you would probably start off as you know, a groundskeeper or a porter and move up to a tech probably like a maintenance supervisor after that and, and then finally went to um, building engineer and then regional national and all that sort of stuff national maintenance directors all that sort of thing is where uh, as your rank or, or position and title goes up so does your responsibility so does your area of operation so does the number of buildings under your under your charge so yeah um, so, if you were to so and just the uh... I'm, I'm sorry, not to cut you off, but it sounds like um, you were just talking about obtaining a lot of information and also that you, it, it sounds like you had some guidance. Would right. you suggest someone to try to seek out? Um, also, Absolutely. maybe some type Absolutely. of some um, mentoring apprenticeship is, or mentorship? Yeah, mentoring apprenticeships is crucial. There is no way that you pass on this, these sorts of skills without that. Um, it's, it's important that the young generation that wants to learn this stuff get in touch with the old generation to figure out those those tricks of the trades, so to speak. So this is virtually impossible to keep reinventing the wheel every time. Because I mean, even still now, even 20 years in, I'm, I'm watching YouTube videos and watching this old house or I'm talking to other uh, professionals and just learning little tricks and just little things like, oh my God, I, I've been doing this that way for 20 years and I, I could have did it this way. Or, even me just teaching of my tricks that I've learned to other people and, they, and they're coming to the same realizations. Oh, wow. If I just stuck an envelope under my screw holes and I would never have dust on the floor, you know, things like that, <laughs> that are just, Sorry. you know, just little things that you, that you need that fellowship with. And, and that's really where the unions and things like that thrive and prosper and make these professions what they are. And that's why they're essential is because you, you really can't learn those skills um, without some sort of mentorship. I, I 100% believe that. Oh, right. Because it just really kind of sheds light on some things that I read up before we spoke. And, you know, coming from the census, there was some really interesting data that I thought was kind of interesting. And maybe I'll ask you, were you aware of, um, you know, from the main things that I really took shocking was that one there's only 1600 black building chief engineers 1600 while there's a total of 18,000 in total population of building chief engineers do you see do you do you see this in your experience are you experiencing as far as at least identity-wise, uh, marginalized trait? Yeah, uh, every single day, uh, essentially. Yeah, um, 
I would say since starting as a chief engineer, I have seen precisely two other black chief engineers. Wow. Um, and so you, you hold on, you say, wh where are you located at again? I'm in Portland, Oregon. And you've only seen two other. Right. And I mean, not even in the flesh. These, these are people that I work with online. And, uh, oh, wow. You know, yeah, one was okay. in Florida, the others in like uh, Tennessee, I believe. And these are people that are within my network. They're within my company network. So like even, you know, I mean, I'm with LinkedIn and Deed and all that stuff. The network for us black engineers is few and far in between. Okay. So that does shed some light and some tangible evidence from your own experience about these numbers. Do you feel like uh, education or just as has been coined a lot, especially recently, gatekeeping of in information, do you feel like that's that's a real thing or is it that we aren't in the right places or people that are Black are maybe not interested? Like, what do you think is the footprint or, or what is the impact that, that we have in these numbers and how do we affect them? It's really funny. Um, it depends on the situation. If in my experience, I have gotten, I guess, you know, I've come across many gatekeepers, but it depends on the level. And I've had um, people willing to teach me things that aren't readily known, but it depends on how far it's expected to get. me. So I've had coworkers that have kind of given me, you know, tips and tricks on, you know, navigating the company or or even like professional t tips and tricks. But as long as it's not to get me above them, uh, oh, wow. not really to go like super far, then it's easily given. Now, on an organizational level, but I mean, you know, I think, I think they feel as if it's being done out of the kindness of their heart is the best way I can say it. So I feel like they have, they feel they have good intentions behind what they're doing, even though it's somewhat narcissistic in the way okay. that they're not. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, they, they tell you what okay. they want to tell you if they feel like, you know, I've even had it go as, as I guess, insidious enough that if they feel that they lost the fight and that you are the winning horse, <laughs> then they will oh. support you in hopes that <laughs> you remember them in the back end. <laughs> so it all depends on motivation, it sounds like. It, whether right. it's personal motivation for the person who has the information, if they have sanctified <laughs> the other person enough to fill them worthy pending certain criteria. Right, right. And That's deep. The other level okay. that I'd like to discuss is from like an organizational level. Like you'll find yourself entering organizations and maybe your own company. It may be your school or, you know, club or business interest that you're in, networking group. And like that organization itself won't let you know certain opportunities exist or won't let you figure out how those channels are spread. Like if there's a certain newsletter or things like that, then that information somehow won't come to you or, you know, so then you're always finding yourself befriending that 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 gatekeeper that inroad person that sees you as that one in ten thousand that doesn't see you quite as a threat so you know or they take pity on you that's the other thing mm -hmm. or they you know they they say they're you know it's almost like they're caping for you so it's like oh man did, you didn't know about this program oh man yeah yeah they're telling you this is the program this is how it works through you know and a lot of times that program may not even really be set up for you it's, it's got it's got other people in mind. That's probably the best way that I can say it. And okay. or even that you'll find yourself like because maybe they've underestimated your talents and experiences. They 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 suggest something to you that that you're actually way outclassed for. So that when you actually go and inquire about this <laughs> this program or opportunity, you find out that you've already excelled beyond it and they're they're looking at you like, you know, you're just trying to abuse the system or something. So <laughs> it's just it's it's really weird. It's like a catch twenty two wow. of, of trying to figure 
figure out the crossroads. No, I mean, not to say that I haven't had people help me with legitimate opportunities and legitimate, you know, chances at things with legitimate information, but it takes a discerning mind to figure out how far do you act on these things? You know, what are they really saying? Uh, what are the consequences even of your actions? Or, you know, so it's, it's, it's very nuanced in the so-called uh, help that you get. Oh, oh, okay. So, wow. That was a lot to digest and unpack. So, if these are the are the experiences that you've had, what do you think are the experiences that keep you motivated with so many concerns, with so many uh, not being represented, not being shared same information, potentially intentionally led astray in a way? What, what, what makes you still you know, still there as far as the passion of it, I'm assuming just because of the length of your experience that there's still a passion for it. So what keeps you pivoting around the negative? Honestly, the KISS method, keep it stupid simple, is the likes. I do it for the likes, you know. Um, as a building engineer, even when I was maintenance supervisor, you know, I worked for uh, the Beaverton School District out here in Oregon for a while. You do it for the likes uh, when people, not even so much a boss, the people that your work directly affects when they compliment your work, it means a little bit more. So like, you know, my residents here at this building, even my, uh, my commercial tenants, you know, when I go above and beyond for them and it's recognized, that is what I appreciate. When I see Google reviews, that is my resume, honestly, more so than the paper that I give anybody else. Cause you know, once I get my resume to someone else and they look at that and they know, oh, you work at that building. They're going to look at that building and look at the reviews. <laughs> They're going to figure it all out. I like, mean, oh, no, it does hold weight it. now. It's a currency now. It Likes, is. shares, especially when you start talking about marketing dollars, they have quantitative value. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So th that's what I do it for. And it is a self-serving, I guess, in a way, but like I like that feeling that I've helped somebody, that I made their their day, their stay, their residency, residency here better. Um, you know, I really do take it to heart that I have lives in my hand. That if I don't, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do every day, it negatively affects somebody, even in the smallest way. Like there's, like when you buildings, the facilities, ships, anything that a building engineer, chief engineer is going to take over is his own little world. It's more than like a castle, like it's a microcosm. You know, um, one thing will affect something else, it will affect something else. So if you don't stay on top of every little thing, or if you don't delegate the work effectively, or if you don't have the manpower to, to keep up with things, like it becomes really tight, it can become really loose, and people can get hurt in behind it. People can lose money or property, keepsakes in behind it, you know, um, dealing like with a classic problem with every property is like floods, like somebody leave a pot in their sink and left the water on or fell asleep in the bathtub or something like that. And now you've got 30 units that have got water damage and somebody's uh, family photo album got soaked in water, you know, things like that, or like the family Bible got destroyed or, People are having a fire and, you know, uh, <laughs> doors get kicked in, you know, people's st stuff gets dis destroyed. And yeah, actually, you know, it, respect to everyone who is affected by those fires that just happened out in New York and all of the crazy conflict and layering of information that's going out there. But nevertheless, you can't re replace anybody. So definitely just as a as a family person my heart goes out to those um there's actually two big fires recently so in new york and i believe it was baltimore i want to say it was another big city um but yeah definitely i mean i guess this reflects on how imperative the details are yeah if i remember All of them. correctly it was faulty name like just bad maintenance for the building is is where a lot of that happened and if like things have been checked or followed up on maybe some of those fires wouldn't have happened. And, and that is like something that that falls on me. And I feel, you know, I, I feel like when black men get into 
a profession, it, it becomes their child in a way because they're judged so much more on it. And it's, it's innate. That Do you feel as if though um, <clears throat> black men in profession are disproportionately um, weighed completely in Absolutely. certain aspects? Absolutely. Just from the, uh, the, the purely comedic, it's almost like National Lampoon, the purely comedic reactions I get from people when they find out that I'm the chief of the what do you mean, oh, like? Or what do you so, mean, like? Can no give idea. us story time, story time. Like, you, I've been communicating me. with someone, with like a vendor, completely through email. You know, uh, my name, my last name is English, my first name is Greek, so it's kind of hard to to figure out <laughs> whether or not I'm a, I'm a black person, and I'm an English major. So is you know, I, I I write very well. So usually, you know, if I've been communicating with somebody over email. And then they suddenly have to meet me at the building or something like that. You know, I open up the door for them. I've got my uniform on and everything, ID on me. You know, I got a, a two big old key rings on me, uh, work boots, utility pants. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I look the part. I welcome them into the building. And they're like, you know, oh, hey, you know, thanks for letting me in. You know, just kind of milling about. And it's like, well, yeah, you, you're here to see Damien, right? You're here to see me. Oh, oh, you're, 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 oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm here to see you. Well, who else is going to be here at 11 o'clock in this uniform to let you in the building with the guy that you were emailing? <laughs> well, I mean, wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, just give us just a slight, not that this is a dating app, but what, what is your, what, 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 what is your, what do you look like when, you know, like what, what are they expecting? I don't, you know, this, I guess this is a reason for my platform. I, I really wonder about microaggressions becoming macro and them being unchecked and them just exploding. And this alone is a thing. These are so many other layers to emotions that people that are Black have. And I think they're also untouched because it makes people uncomfortable. As, but it's as long as we're uncomfortable, sometimes things seem okay. Well, absolutely, because that's not even really a thought. It's sometimes I feel as if, you know, they don't even believe we have the emotional capability of feeling, that, you know, the speculation. So it doesn't cross their mind. So that's why they feel so, you know, at ease with, with showing like shock or disbelief or, you know, any. You know, they, they, they can't control themselves when, when it's outside of their norm, you know, I should say. Mm. Well, yeah. And then I just want to, this is going to seem like a rewind, all the way rewind. But so you, you came to me and you were chief engineer, but you just said you were English major. I, explain. Right. Um, that That's sort of what I mean by you don't have to to go down like the the whole plumbing road of to become a, a chief engineer really it's it, it's hinged on experience uh i went to university studied what i wanted to study got a bachelor's degree in what i wanted to get a bachelor's degree in and that was english and a minor in writing uh and i used my experience to get my job to to where i am now is my know-how uh do I know what I'm talking about? Actually, my um, proximity and knowledge of the city, uh, vendors, uh, the industry as a whole already, I already knew about, I was already exposed to from my previous job as just a maintenance supervisor. And that was essentially a chief engineer role just at a smaller property. So that's what I mean. It has to do with scale where that supervisor position was a hundred and some odd units. This chief engineer I've got 400 and some odd units and, and commercial tenants as well. So it really so, is. So with that English, were you, I'm, I'm just, were you intending to do something with that or was your intention for that to strengthen you as you develop your engineer skill set or what yeah. was, what exactly was your plan at that point? At first it was for a long time to be a, uh, to be a teacher something away from 
I guess the militant side of the Marine Corps. Like I was in the Marine Corps and you know when to get out of that. I wasn't like um, an infantry or anything like that, but it's still a militant mindset. And I wanted to get away from that. I wanted to to be a teacher for the longest time. Um, and you know, parts of me still do. I just my discrepancy with like the education system as a whole, and then trying to figure out where I, I fit in as a teacher. Like, what what role is that going to be? Is that going to be in you know early education, or is that going to be in you know collegiate level, high school? Uh, so that's kind of different nuances to that too. And I just wasn't sure. Um, and actually. <laughs> It's kind of ironic, my time working as a maintenance uh, custodian at Beaverton School District, I was in such proximity to, I guess, contemporary education and kind of put a bad taste in my mouth in a way, mm. Uh, mm. especially okay. since okay. as homogenous Oregon is, um, it's not as diverse as, say, Philadelphia, San Francisco, L.A., New York, and all those other places. Even Seattle, I would say, is more diverse than Portland. Um, wow, that's just north of... That's just north. Yeah. That's not yeah. too far. Not too far. It's only three hours, 150 miles. Um, but it's, it's a completely different climate. I mean, for the most part, the Pacific Northwest is the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and I think when you're talking about the majority of the people, they have a common culture, but there are pockets of diversity that that do that do mix things up and give things its own its own character. Uh, but Portland, Beaverton area, um, it's the metro area is probably the most liberal part of uh, Oregon. So I, I did see a lot of advancements with the education system in, in, with the Beaverton School District. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed my time working there, et cetera, but when I saw that it wasn't much different from when I was in school 30 years ago, it kind of made me lose a little bit of hope. Wow. Where it's wow. like, I can do this then. I mean, I mastered that, right? Like, I mastered second and third grade. I can teach my son number blocks and the number line and all that sort of stuff, so... I'm not really understanding, but but you de- but you definitely see the institutional institutionalization. You know, you see those tools used, mm-hmm. and as an adult, even you know, at, on the outside of it, like seeing the kids go through it, and like seeing the, the tables lined up and the cubby holes, and like really what it's about is the structure. You know, yeah, really, you know, yeah. The education tools are crumbling and decaying, but the things that keep them in line are good. Like they had brand new desks and old books, so it was, it was really <laughs> right. Right. I mean, a lot of a lot of people are starting to talk on, especially in our communities and just in pivotal forward thinking arenas. A lot of people are talking about how schools are really just structuring the children to be accommodating to a work life and not a progressive life. And what I mean by is, you know, the day is structured before all intents purposes there in block scheduling. Um, and what it, that is, is to perform at a certain level. And if they are scheduled to go into school at a certain time, leave at a certain time, and it's just reiterated, throughout the week that is really teaching them how to work a nine to five as opposed to really giving them the skill sets that they should get and do need to be prosperous and involving people in in society and for instance I mean I know I think we're about the same age like I know we had home ec and that's not even a thing I mean they even took recess which I mean I feel like as kids we just thought it was for fun but really that is a that's a necessary balancer of your day to readjust and restructure your day. So it seems as if, you know, a lot of things, you know, really, if this was the industrial era, they would be preparing children for the factory. Absolutely. And I don't like one thing that I noticed too, I know parents all over the country are probably going through this and I don't know if they quite are looking at it this way. So I want to say it this way is that the school is, the, the, the structure of the school is purposely manipulating the structure of the family. And I mean that by 
their special schedules that these children are going on now, even before the pandemic, because I was working there in 2018, 2019, even before the pandemic, there were special schedules where the kids were getting out at earlier times, Wednesdays were different, Mondays were different. And I can't really see how a, an adult working a nine to five can accommodate that. And then what do you do with your children afterwards? And then you see how the schools structure those um, those hours. They structure those schedules so that they can make money. Uh, mm. What a lot of people don't know is that the schools run and operate daycare centers, centers essentially after after school. So they'll keep your kids until about 6 o'clock, 6.30 at night. And so you- by increasing population, by increasing time duration, they're increasing, increasing income. Need. Increasing need. Because if the kids were there yeah. until maybe yeah. 3 30 like like traditionally people would have a job where by the time that you might that's i guess where the latchkey kids like when we were in a you would get home and by the time you get home <laughs> at 4 30 your parents get home by like six so you're really only by yourself for maybe an hour you know <laughs> you know what i'm saying and, and, and in that hour i used to remember i had to have my homework done or at least be working on it by the time my, my dad got in you know so dude i know i had to have my homework done and i had to have a shower i had to be like it like yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a single parent household and my mom worked heavily. Yeah, no, there was, we were part of the team. It was right. no, it wasn't like um, my mom in the most kindest way. She didn't evolve around us. We evolved around her because that's what a unit does. That's how you, that's what, that's what teamwork is. <laughs> and, and she's the breadwinner, at the, you know, she's the head of household. So, yeah, that, that's exactly what it's doing. It's making the family centered around this child, but not in a way that it's like truly affecting their education. Conducive to, right. They're not, you know, saying, you know, like have parents come in and, and, and actually teach or not. Or, you know, I remember when I was a kid, my dad was pretty much a chaperone at one point. <laughs> like he, would, he would be on the, the yard uh, with us kids, making sure nothing happened to us. Him and another dad, they just were there. And, you know, they didn't get paid by the school or anything like that. They just were just there making sure everything was, was cool and copacetic. Nobody would come try and mess with us kids. And, like, I don't really see that as a as a culture here now. And, like I said, um, we went to school. This is probably the best school district in Oregon. And, I mean, they have a lot of advancements. They, they have a lot of opportunities. They even have an international school. Or if you want to put your kid on that track to, to do high school in Germany or France or something like that, like there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, Nike headquarters is out here. They, you know, Intel is out here. There's, there's money <laughs> in that right. county. You guys have Columbia. You have, there's a few tech companies. I think you guys have some uh, car companies out there too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to be able to school district and overall my experience was really good there because it gave me even more knowledge to get to to get this chief engineer role um 54 different buildings in that uh 54 or 56 now probably uh different buildings in that that school district and all, all ranging from different ages from 60 years ago to 10 years ago so just the different systems that you get to learn and come across and fix and like all that stuff within a year condensed down was 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 a gold mine, and that's what I mean by uh, getting that experience. Getting hands on is really the way if you want to project your 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 career that way. You can say, first thing you got to do is say what you want to be. Because I want to be a chief engineer. I want to run that building. Like you walking downtown, you, you like in Philly, you see Liberty One. Who runs that building? Who makes sure that everything in that building gets done? In a building like Liberty One, you probably have two chief engineers on, or two, not chief, not two chief engineers, but you probably have a chief engineer and then like a manager that assists, that assists him because it's such a big building. It's even bigger than the one that I run. So you got to point your, your career in that direction and apply for those jobs. Take your experience, tailor your resume. Tailor yeah, your I always say, what is the worst someone can say after no? And if no, is it that? That's nothing to me. That's how I've always kind of been. And I feel like that may be, you know, what you're, what you're, you know, talking about. Like, no is not the worst. Believe me. Is that you're just where you were before. 
you know, any more right. soft than you were. So it's it's. And really, I think the question is, how do I do that? Not, I can't do that, or people like me don't do that, or I don't have what it takes. No, what do I need to get what it takes to do that? I can do that. And, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot about a few things, and hopefully I'll get you back on. It's kind of crazy how this time has went past. Um, I just wanted to end it on a on a really just quick note about um, how important do you think it is for people of color, minorities, and, and specifically Black people to get more involved and aware of this track? And also those other um, supporting industri- industry jobs, like you talking about chief engineers, and then there's also property owners, there's also investors. I know there's other facets, but you know, just how important do you think it is to bump this 1600 number up? I can't believe this, like 9%. It is, it's really, it really kind of took me for a love, like, wait a minute. But you know, what is your, what, what would be your, you know, your token for the end for people to take away? How important do you think it is for for people, especially like us, to be well diverse or to become diverse and become at least aware of the skill sets and and the opportunities that your profession provides? I believe it's existential for more black men to learn these sorts of professions. Um, I wouldn't know it if it hadn't been for black men. I didn't have proximity to whiteness to pick up welding or any of these like trades that some of these guys, even forklifting, you know, I've worked in warehouses, but never had the proximity to the white forklift drivers to learn how to drive a forklift. And that's not everybody's story. Um, I have met white forklift drivers willing to teach, you know, so there is opportunities. You have to find them. You do have to look for them. And sometimes you have to shoehorn your way into it. You got to wiggle. Um, But I do understand on the flip side, there are gatekeepers. There are people that don't want us in there. There are people that see our our success as their failure. So going going with that in mind, you definitely have to do everything with discernment and realize that it is existential, that in some way, shape, or form, you have to throw yourself into those circles because we have the inclination. I had the inclination to do this work before I even knew what a building engineer was. And if it wasn't for homologies like Alvin Grant and Tom Holland to, that saw that in me and then fostered it, then I wouldn't be here to tell somebody on this radio show. So, or this podcast. Um, so it's existential. These are the things that we need to know and pass on because these are the things that if they are gate kept that is the difference between our success and failure because you know a lot of times opportunity is all about time and just because someone teaches you something they may not teach it to you in time there's lessons i'm learning 20 years down the road that if i knew them 15 years earlier who knows where i'd be right now you'd be even further along than what i am so and then think about if you didn't even have that mentorship mentorship seems monumental very that hands-on, I know I'm that type of learner. I'm a very hands-on. You can tell me anything and I'll ab- absorb it. But if you show me, I can I can completely implicate it immediately. I can do it. It's fine. That's that's math. That's how I learn statistics so fast. That's how I do accounting. Like, it's just, it's just really helpful for me to do actually things in, in fact. So I think it would, it definitely probably help you. Um, and it probably would even more help you if you had even more. Um, but I definitely want to thank you for joining us and I hate to have the end of the hour seem so long 40 minutes ago, but here we are. <laughs> and I really want to thank you for blessing our first episode and hopefully we'll reconvene and touch on this again. And if there's any other engineers out there that want to connect or any other people that are interested, I'll definitely have his contact information in the bottom Thank you, Damien. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being so honest and transparent about your experience. And we appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and have a good day. You too.